Yeah, so welcome everybody to today's special year seminar uh, on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today we are delighted to have Professor John Shaw Taylor as our speaker. John is a professor at the University College London and is known for his fundamental contributions to kernel methods and statistical learning theory. Among his best known contributions are the introduction of generalization bounds for structural risk minimization with data dependent hierarchies of hypothesis classes, the development of algorithms for kernel canonical correlation analysis, co-invention of the one class support vector machines. He serves as the director of the Center for Computational Statistics and Machine Learning at UCL and has also been instrumental in assembling a series of influential European networks of excellence. Additionally, he's an author of two books on kernel methods for pattern analysis and an introduction to support vector machines, which have become standard monographs for the study of kernel methods. Today, John will tell us about statistical learning theory for modern machine learning. Please welcome John Shaw Taylor. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor to, to speak uh, at this venue or through this venue. I don't know exactly how we say it these days, but anyway, it's great to have an opportunity to speak. Uh, and as Kay said, if there are questions, please feel free. I'll try and take a pause every now and then and uh, we can catch up with any questions. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was, uh, again, I wasn't quite sure where uh, the interest would be um, best served, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of the issues of statistical learning theory and the classical versions thereof, uh, and their, in a sense, their shortcomings, um, but how these uh, have been, to a large extent, overcome for modern machine learning, um, and even for deep learning, in certain scenarios. So I'm not claiming, you know, a kind of panacea, but uh, there are certain scenarios in which we can uh, achieve really quite accurate bounds, but these are certainly not covering all of the interesting cases or, you know, so there's plenty more to do, but I think the idea that there's no hope of analyzing deep learning is certainly not, uh, from a generalization point of view, is certainly not the case. Uh, bringing to bear modern machine learning methods. So um, with that, I'll move to uh, a sort of general introduction, which I'll skip through quite quickly. Um, so learning is about being able to generalize, uh, uh, it, or that's at least one of the key features. And if we take this very simple example from Wikipedia, we can see how there's a structure that leaps out of the page given by the dark line and a kind of probably wrong structure given by the green line. And so the question is, how do we infer the right structure from or, or capture the underlying phenomenon not misled by uh, noise in a particular data set? So memorizing the already seen data is usually bad, so it leads to overfitting. And generalization is the ability to perform well on unseen data. So one of the key things here is that uh, we're only actually given one data set. And so we need to be able to understand how to uh, derive confident bounds from that single data set. Uh, so statistical learning theory is about how that question of how to divide high, how to provide high confidence bounds uh, from a single data set. Um, for a fixed algorithm, function class, sample size, generating random samples, we have actually a distribution of test errors. So the basic model, I'll give a little bit more formal in a minute, but uh, the basic model is you're assuming a distribution, a background distribution that's generating your data. And this is being used to generate both your training examples and your test uh, examples. And it's about learning about that distribution from your training sample in such a way that you perform well on your test data. Um, but the actual sample you get is drawn randomly, so it's a random sample. So we have to be sure that if we draw many different random samples, we'll actually get a distribution of test errors. Uh, and the question is, what should we do? How should we 
think about analyzing that distribution. And perhaps the obvious thing is to think about the mean of that error distribution. And, and to some extent, that makes the analysis easier. But it can be very misleading. Um, and I'll give an example of that. So statistical learning theory has focused on the tail of the distribution. So what it's trying to do is to say that uh, the chances of you doing worse than this theory predicts or this algorithm will should deliver is very low. So with high confidence, we're going to get a performance that's at least as good as this. Uh, and that bound is being uh, with high confidence over that randomly generating generated training set. So it's similar to a statistical test, you know, 95, 99% confidence that what the theorem says will be true. Um, and this is the basis of so-called probably approximately correct learning. There's a parameter delta, which is this confidence parameter, uh, and that's the uh, probable part. And the approximately correct part is the idea that the chances of the uh, algorithm delivering a solution that's not approximately correct, in other words, the chances of it having a large error um, is less than delta, or with high confidence it is uh, giving a, a, a low error. So with high confidence, the prob probability of being approximately correct is greater than one minus delta. So here's just a diagram actually of some real uh, trials with random samples for a particular data set. It's the breast cancer data set of the UCI repository. And we've looked at the distribution of test errors that we get as we do random training uh, sets. Uh, and we've compared two algorithms, one that's a kind of more uh, basic algorithm, the cars and window, just uh, generating a, an expectation of, of low error. And then the support vector machine algorithm, and I'll talk more about, that is trying to bound this tail of the distribution. And you can see that, you know, it sort of does what it says on the tin. You know, the actual uh, chances of doing badly in the SVM case are controlled very well compared to the chances of doing badly in the parts and window case while the means are actually very comparable. So if we were to analyze these two algorithms based on the mean, we would not actually see a great deal of difference. But in terms of this confidence parameter that I, I've been suggesting is key, uh, there is a big difference. So I'm just gonna skip again quite quickly through the mathematical formulation. We're thinking of a learning algorithm being a mapping from uh, a set of training examples. Um, uh, to a hypothesis class, set of predictors. Uh, a training set is then just this set of uh, examples which are typically given with an input and a correct output, or uh, which is the, uh, the training input-output examples. And as I said, the classical assumptions are there's a generating data-generating distribution that uh, generates these examples and the samples are generated IID, so they're independently, identically distributed, so that uh, the sample SN is drawn according to P to the N. However, the learner doesn't know P and only learns about P through this uh, training set. Uh, some of these uh, assumptions can be relaxed, but not in this talk, okay? Um, so what do we want to achieve from the sample? We want to obviously learn a predictor, but from a statistical learning theory point of view, we want to also certify the predictor's performance. We want to have some measure that we can be confident will uh, govern the performance of this predictor when we apply it to new data drawn according to the same distribution. Um, so typically learning a predictor, the algorithm is driven by some learning principle, perhaps informed by prior knowledge, uh, resulting in inductive bias, and certifying performance is what happens beyond the training set and uh, is, is the focus of generalization bounds. So maybe I'll just pause there for any questions. Just That's just set the scene as it were, nothing hopefully too controversial. Okay.
I'll, I'll move on in that um, case. Unless anyone. Uh, sorry, okay. Yeah, carry on. Okay. Uh, so I, yeah, I maybe I'll just mention. So, okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so actually, just to mention that these two goals interact with each other uh, because typically we are interested in generalization bands that will certify the performance of an algorithm. So the algorithm will inform the generalization band, but then a good generalization band may actually suggest an algorithm because optimizing that band is presumably going to optimize the performance on you in terms of its uh, predictive power. So these are kind of tightly related. Um, and you know, a lot of the early work in statistical learning theory has produced rather weak bounds, but nonetheless, using those bounds to motivate learning algorithms proved very productive. So there was a kind of uh, you know, feedback loop here that was, which, was, uh, which was useful. Uh, and what I hope to show you today is that we're actually getting certification now that is really uh, pretty tight, even for deep networks under these assumptions that I've made. You know. Okay, so the typical measure is through of a performance is through a loss function, uh, which is a discrepancy between the predicted output and the true output for that uh, example. True may be a too strong word. I mean, it may be, we're thinking of this distribution is generating inputs and outputs. There may be inherent in that distribution some errors as well. Uh, that so this true output is the output generated by that distribution. Uh, there's an empirical risk, which is just the uh, average loss on the training data in sample, as it were, and then there's the expected risk on new data or theoretical risk, which is the expectation of the risk on a randomly drawn test point out of sample. And then you know a lot of risk functions could be considered. We're going to focus mainly on the zero one classification loss, but you can think of squared loss for regression, uh, hinge loss, which is often used in training as a substitute or a, a surrogate loss for this zero one loss, and log loss again can be used for density estimation. And the to do, you should ignore that. Uh, sorry. Uh, so um, I'm now going to do a very quick uh, slide, just summarizing some of the basics that one can do um, basically for a single hypothesis it's just a, an application of something like perfect things inequality will give you this kind of bound um, and if you do a union bound over a finite function class you can get something like this very simply using the um, yeah, union bound uh, you can actually do something a little bit more subtle by putting uh, weights on a finite uh, or even countably infinite set of hypotheses, uh, prior weights. And uh, then you get a bound like this, where the bound uh, has a function dependent term here in this PI, this prior one log one over PI, where PI is the prior prob probability that you assign. So this starts to kind of give a feel for the direction we're going in terms of uh, the uh, pack base analysis that I'll introduce in a minute, which has this idea of a prior and posterior distribution. Uh, but before I go to that, I'd just like to mention very classical work in, um, in uh, uh, sort of statistical learning theory, the VC dimension. And this is, I think, something that's worth just bringing up because it's led to this idea that statistical learning theory is uh, somehow worst case. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is a characterization of learning uh, based on the VC dimension that it has a certain if and only if, so you can learn if the VC dimension is finite and you can't if it's not. The problem is that those two are not entirely equivalent in the sense that you can't, if they're not, means that there exists a distribution on the input data that will force you to make high errors. But it doesn't say that every distribution will force you to make high errors. 
And in fact, we'll see, you know, that in cases where the VC dimension is infinite, we can still learn and still get bounds that are very tight. So this worst case kind of, uh, uh, if you like, frame is only in the sense that the uh, VC dimension says that there can, you know, you can be forced to make errors. So as soon as we're into anything that's not finite VC dimension, if we're going to get statistical learning theory bounds, it means that we're actually on the fly measuring something about the distribution. So the fact that we've got a good bound means the distribution actually must have been in some way aligned with the target function we're trying to learn, and it's actually helping us to learn it. Because we know that if the distribution was bloody-minded, excuse my expression, but then we would not be able to learn. So th that is the basis of also this idea of the luckiness uh, framework that was uh, mentioned by Kay in the introduction. So, uh, so these approaches that are up till now are all suited to analyze the performance of individual functions, uh, and they take different account of correlations between functions. So the whole trick is that you know, here you are essentially treating each function as independent. In the case of the VC dimension, you're actually able to take into account, since you have infinitely many potentially functions, your, you know, this bound would be trivial, yet the VC dimension can deliver because it takes into account uh, some, you know, correlations between functions. But uh, the methods that actually are able to do this more effectively that I'm going to talk about is this packed Bayes analysis that uh, uh, actually allows us to consider distributions over hypotheses rather than single hypotheses. So uh, a quick introduction to the packed Bayes framework. So before we see the data, we have to fix a distribution, uh, which is the prior, uh, will be referred to as the prior. And then based on the data, we actually choose a posterior distribution, which I'm going to denote Q. Uh, oh, this is over the hypothesis. So we remember we have the distribution over the generating the data. That's on the data. These are distributions over the functions that we might use to classify or, or, or uh, analyze that data. So when we make a prediction, we have to draw a function from Q and predict with that function. So we get a test point. We draw the function from Q and we make a prediction. So each prediction has to be used a fresh draw. And our risk measures that are used in terms of the uh, analysis are the expected risk of, the, uh, of that uh, process of drawing the function according to Q. Uh, and the in sample or you know, training risk is the given in this way. And the outer sample risk is given in this way. Um, so the uh, callback library divergence, I'm sure we don't need to say what that is. Um, so I think that's worth spending just a moment uh, kind of drawing an analogy with Bayesian inference. So Bayesian inference is a, a classical statistical method for learning, which posits uh, the existence of a prior distribution. So it sounds very similar to this pack Bayesian analysis. Uh, and then creates a posterior distribution. So again, there's an analogy here, and then makes a prediction uh, according to the posterior distribution, either by choosing the maximum posteri uh, a posteriori function or by taking an average, but not the average that the pack base is taking. It's the average over the expected average over the distribution of functions. Um, so, the difference that uh, there are several key differences, I think. First, the Bayesian inference, the, if you like, the philosophy behind it and, and its motivation relies on an assumption that the prior distribution is correct. So as soon as the prior distribution, and, and there's also a question of what correct means. So it correct, I mean, and, and philosophical discussions can be had about the definition of correct. Is it, you know, in all sorts of universes or whatever? And the second point that uh, is important is that the uh, 
there is a unique way of going from the prior to the posterior, and it's based on a likelihood model. Uh, so based on the likelihood of the data in that model. So that the posterior distribution is a, a unique, uh, correct choice, as it were. So in the PAC phase model, we have a very different situation. Firstly, it doesn't matter what prior we use, the theory is going to be correct. It may be more useful if we use a good prior, but the theory doesn't depend on the prior being in some way chosen correctly in, in whatever way. Um, and secondly, we can choose the posterior distribution in any way we choose um, using the data. So the only difference is the prior mustn't depend on the data, but the posterior can. Um, so it's inspired by the Bayesian up, update, but is actually uh, uh, much more flexible and can depend on the loss function. So there's an inherent involvement of the loss function in making the choice of the posterior distribution. So a prior is a sort of expiration mechanism, posterior is the prior after confronting the data, but the update is in uh, very different in the two cases. Um, and just to sort of make this point perhaps uh, to death, but hopefully not, it, it, the pack based plan holds for any distribution, the prior choice uh, impacts inference in the Bayes case, the posterior bound holds for only distribution, but the Bayes posterior is uniquely defined by the statistical model. Uh, and in the data distribution, back Bayes bounds hold for any distribution of uh, the generating the data. Uh, in the Bayesian model, the data in some sense is only, the randomness in the data is only in the noise model that's affected the uh, generating the output. Okay, so, Maybe I'll just pause in case there are any questions uh, quickly. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, maybe that. Uh, so, uh, so this is the general pack based theorem. Um, just talk very uh, sort of at the top level about this. The idea is that there's uh, this convex function delta that maps the interval um, uh, uh, with itself to R, and it's a convex function, and we use it to uh, link the uh, in sample risk to the outer sample risk. Remember, in samples on the training data, outer sample is our test risk that we're interested in. And uh, the bound involves the KL divergence between our uh, prior distribution and posterior distribution. So clearly, there's a, a force here trying, you know, there's two things here uh, working at odds. One is saying, I want my posterior to give me uh, a good uh, in sample performance, uh, but I don't want it to be too far from my prior. Uh, so that is the sort of basis of a pack Bayes inspired algorithm is to balance those two constraints. Uh, there's one extra term here, which is uh, the following, um, and it's a, yeah, sort of a exponential moment function. Uh, which can be bounded in many cases by a constant or a, or a sort of small function of n. Uh, so we'll give examples of that in a minute. Um, so the uh, basis, uh, I'm just going to give some uh, sort of indications of how the proof works. I mean, the main thing I want to convey here is that the proof is not actually very hard. I mean, it's not, we're not talking some very complex mathematics. It's basically a change of measure at heart. Uh, and it's just a matter of setting it up correctly. Uh, so if this is the change of measure part that you need. Uh, so you start with a, a H drawn according to P and you move to H according to Q uh, and introduce this correction factor and then move the log through the uh, expectation and by Jensen's inequality, we get the KL divergence here and this expectation of phi of H. So this is the thing that's going to end up being that uh, I del uh, log I delta of N 
uh, sorry, the I delta of n power. Um, and of course, Markov's inequality we're going to use uh, in order to get this uh, this part here in terms of delta, uh, and that will be when it will hold with high probability. So that's again nothing very surprising. Um, and this again is just very basic stuff. So um, so here's the, the the outline of the proof just to sort of show how it fits together. We start with this uh, m times this remember convex function expected uh, in sample risk, expected out sample risk, move the, um, the uh, expectation through the uh, delta function by convexity and Jensen's inequality, we get the inequality. Uh, then we use that uh, change of measure inequality that I showed you with phi equal to this quantity here, uh, and we get the KL divergence plus the this log of the uh, expectation over h according to p. Remember, this is the prior of this uh, this expression here. Um, then, with Markov's inequality, we get with high probability this, where we've introduced this extra expectation here uh, into this, and the one on delta. And uh, um, then we swap the uh, expectations, and finally we introduce that. Uh, Binary ex, uh, evaluation uh, based. This is for the uh, binary loss, and uh, we can uh, end up with this expression here. Uh, and indeed, that is the I delta of n expression. So, uh, hopefully, you know, I, I wouldn't just wanted to convey that this is not, you know, a hugely complicated. Uh, proof and but it has many moving parts, which actually is one of the strengths of the theory. I think there are many ways you can adapt to take into account different situations. I perhaps mentioned some of those. So here are some of the, if you like, corollaries of that theorem. Um, if we use for delta the, the KL between two uh, binary distributions with uh, probabilities p uh, one being R in the in sample risk rate and P2 being the out sample risk rate. So, this is the KL that using KL in that small KL in that sense. Um, between, think of this as just a, uh, you know, a distribution between either making an error or not making an error. Um, then we end up with this Langford uh, and Seeger bound. Um, there's a slight tightening here that's been made to uh, root M from their original, which was. Uh, a result, uh, a recent, more recent result, but it's not uh, that important. There's the McAllister bound, which was uh, actually un undoes this uh, KL, or the, you know uses the different delta to uh, give this quantity. Um, and there's a Cotoni bound, which uses a, a slightly different way of unraveling this uh, expression in order to get. So these all follow. From this single, if you like, uh, expression, uh, using different examples for the um, the uh, delta function. So the, in the third case, is delta c is this expression. In the second case, is this. Um, and then there's a further bound, which is uh, using yet another expression for the uh, convex function. So. Um, and just to give an example of how that's followed through in terms of bounding that remaining quantity that was unknown, uh, there's this expression that we need to bound that I mentioned with either a, a you know, sort of modest function of M. This is the result due to Maurer that I mentioned that is basically bounding it in terms of two root M. An even simpler uh, proof will give you two, uh, M plus one here. Uh, so I, I won't go into any detail there, um, except to say that this is all true only if the samples are drawn IID. Uh, so in this case, if they're not IID, the, the result is no longer valid. However, the general theorem is valid. So the uh, so there's, uh, you know, a question. As I said, there's a lot of moving parts, and it may be possible. And there's been some recent work that has looked at uh, 
covering the non-IAD case in you know in certain cases. Uh, so I won't, but I won't be talking about that. So I'm now going to just show the application to support vector machines and and give you an idea of how these. Uh, uh, but before I do that, I'll again pause quickly in case there are any questions. Looks like we're good. Okay. We uh, we actually do have one question. Um, okay. The question is from Kevin. Uh, the question is, how do you handle the case where H is not a binary class of R, so R of H may not be in the interval between 0 and 1? Okay. Uh, so these uh delta can be chosen differently i haven't covered that case here but the basis of the theorem is pretty much identical uh of course this this argument here has to be handled differently because you can't bound this expression using this binomial trick uh but the, these things can be bounded for special cases so the, the hard part is how do you bound this uh expression Okay, um, thank you. The next question is um, from Daniel Severo. Um, the question is, is the, is the delta function any convex function which captures the no, uh, notion of uh, notation of generalization with respect to whatever context we're working with? How does one go about selecting a delta function? So I think more, you know, it's more at a, a meta level. It's more about the, for example, the the type of loss function that you might be considering and its uh, range. Uh, I don't think it's so. So it's more the type of uh, loss function that you might be considering that would affect that choice. Thank you. Okay, those are all okay. the questions. Okay, um, so I'm going to now quickly cover the uh, how this is applied to linear classifiers, um, just to show, you know, how the theory maps onto a particular example, um, and also how we overcome in this case the um, this problem that the classification is randomized. So you know you have to draw a new uh, example each time. Uh, so the way, again, I think it shows the flexibility of the method. We can choose uh, distributions, as I indicated, in any way we want, and this, the, the theorem is valid. Um, so we can choose simple distributions that make the analysis easy. There may be tighter ways of doing it, but this is certainly a, a you know a very uh, agreeable way to work, and indeed a way that often. Bayesians would work, but I, I, you know, in that case, there's perhaps harder to justify. Uh, so we choose a prior and posterior distributions to be uh, Gaussians with unit variance, the prior centered at the origin, and the uh, posterior centered at the weight vector uh, delivered by the learning algorithm, uh, but the scale by a factor mu. So the uh, the factor mu scales the weight vector. Um, so if we think about it, here's our prior at the origin, and then there's a direction given by the weight vector, and then there's a, a measure mu uh, that we move in that direction, and that's where we place the posterior distribution. So if we look at the band, uh, let's look at some of the components. First of all, this is the uh, measure, this is the uh, risk, out of sample risk. So this is the true performance of the stochastic classifier. Uh, but the, the SEM is deterministic classifier. So uh, exactly it corresponds to the sign of the uh, uh, average of the classifications of this stochastic classifier, as the center of the Gaussian gives the same classification as uh, half space with more weight. Uh, that's because it's a, a, a spherical, you know, symmetrical distribution and it's a linear classifier. So we can bound the error by twice the stochastic classifier, uh, since if we observe above, the X is misclassified at least half, uh, uh, at least half of the C uh, uh, 
uh, if, if an X is misclassified by the center of that uh, uh, distribution. Uh, here's the uh, empirical uh, in sample risk. Uh, it's a stochastic measure on the training error. Uh, it can actually be exactly computed in this case, uh, and it's given by uh, this expression where the gamma is the uh, margin of the example. So this is our test, uh, this is our example test or training, but in this case it's training. Uh, this is the input, this is the, uh, the margin normalized according to the norm of the, uh, of the input as well as the norm of the weight vector. And this is the cumulative, or sorry, one minus the cumulative normal distribution. So we can actually compute it exactly in this case. So the KL divergence is now between two Gaussians. That's trivial to compute. Uh, and it's just uh, mu squared over two. Uh, the delta is the probability of uh, you, know, you actually being misled by the training data. Um, and uh, the bound holds for all posterior distributions. So we can choose mu to optimize the bound. So we can play around with mu. And so this is actually the expression if we define the inverse of the KL to, of this small KL to be the maximum P for which KL QP is uh, less than or equal to A, then we can write the probability of misclassification is twice. That was that uh, stochastic error conversion to a deterministic, the minimum over mu of this inverse of this expression. And this can be seen to motivate the algorithm of the sport vector machine, which is uh, minimizing a combination of the uh, norm squared of the weight vector and this. Uh, set of losses. Uh, the only difference is we're using in the ISPOR vector machine this red line to measure the loss, whereas in the uh, bound we're actually using this green cross line, but we could see it as an approximation. Um, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about the uh, choice of prior distribution. Uh, I think I've already mentioned that it can be chosen however we like, provided it doesn't uh, depend on the training data. Um, so we have to choose it before seeing the data sample. But are there better ways uh, we can choose uh, a prior? So I'm going to talk about uh, two things. One is learning the prior from, uh, from part of the data uh, and uh, then using that as a prior to, uh, if you like, uh, determine the generalization based on the other data that isn't used to determine the prior. And the other is in terms of defining the prior in terms of the data generating distribution, uh, which is something known as, also known as uh, localized pack bays. Um, so bounds depend on the distance between the uh, prior and posterior. Uh, a better prior would lead to a tighter bound. Uh, so we learn the prior with part of the data, introduce the learned prior into the bound, and then compute the stochastic error with the remaining data. Uh, so the idea is you've learned this from part of the data, this weight vector WR. Um, you choose some, actually this should be eta scaling of that as your prior. You then learn from the full data the weight vector, or uh, that you're actually using to do your classification. So your posterior now is going to be some scaling along that direction. Uh, and then your cost, if you like, in terms of KL divergence is going to be the distance between these two rather than the distance to the origin. So the bound looks somewhat uh, similar, except that now there's this uh, norm squared difference between the two. Uh, uh, well, sorry, first thing to notice is that the empirical error is now estimated just on the remaining examples not used to train the prior, of course. Um, this is now the new KL divergence term, which hopefully is smaller. Um, and uh, then this, of course, now is divided by a smaller quantity since we've only estimated it from M minus R examples. Um, so there's a a loss of effectiveness there. Um, so we can also derive a kind of new 
optimization. This is this idea that once you get a new band, you can derive a, uh, a new algorithm that optimizes the band. This would be the corresponding algorithm that we might call a PSVM, a prior SVM that would optimize. Uh, uh, but it's optimized only, only the remaining points. Uh, so we can uh, determine the prior with that uh, first set of points. You solve the SVM, PSVM to obtain, uh, work out the margins for those points. Uh, again, do a linear search for the optimal mu. Um, there's also another way of possibly doing this, which is uh, having a prior that is elongated along that direction. So we actually uh, think of it as like a rugby ball or you know football in in America, and uh, so it's not spherical but sort of elongated in one direction, and that will allow us to be more flexible about the choice of the uh, prior distribution, and it results in a band of this type, which. Uh, is uh, works quite well. There's very little cost in terms of that elongation um, for the KL divergence, that is. Um, so I think, uh, and you can translate that into another optimization. So putting all of these together um, and doing some experiments, I'm just going to show you a few kind of results to show uh, using comparison with tenfold cross validation and using these different bands to. Uh, do model selection on some UCI data sets uh, and uh, choosing the C parameter, which is this regularization parameter, and sigma, which is somehow controlling the uh, flexibility of the uh, kernel class that we're using um, and uh, using these to do model selection. So I think the thing to so here's the SEM. Here's the eta prior SEM, which I was talking about um, to actually learn using the eta prior. Um, the performance is given. Uh, this is the test error, this row here. And the cross validation error is given either doing twofold or tenfold cross validation. Doing model selection with the pack based band is giving very similar performance, in some cases, quite a lot better. Um, uh, here similar, uh, here slightly worse, but uh, uh, on average, it's certainly very comparable. Um, the interesting thing is these new bands are far tighter. So here the band in the standard pack based model without the prior is uh, much weaker uh, than in this case using, for example, this most complicated tau prior pack base. Uh, but the, cross, the actual model selection is not quite as good. Um, okay, so that's uh, hopefully giving you an idea that these bounds work for these kind of situations. I should emphasize in this case that the uh, PC dimension is infinite. So, you know, classical bounds would deliver nothing in this case um, because we're using a, um, a Gaussian kernel which it can fit any data. Uh, so it has infinite VC dimension. Um, so I think the take home messages are the bounds are, are actually remarkably tight. Uh, in some cases, only a factor of three. Um, model selection from the bounds is also as good as temporal cross-validation. Um, and in uh, one of the pack based model selection gives better averages for test error. Um, However, the better bands do not appear to give better model selection, which is perhaps a little disappointing. So um, I'm going to now talk briefly about the distribution-defined priors. So here uh, is the sort of the uh, Sorry, were there so a question? We do have one question. Sure. Yes. Yeah, please. Um, so the question is from Samori. Um, so does the result you showed um, only apply to cases where the RA, AKHS is finite dimension? No. So, so let me, uh, can I clarify the question? Let me clarify the question. Sure. Uh, so, of course. Yeah, the prior, when you started, uh, it wasn't clear to me in the first part, the prior was a spherical Gaussian, it seemed like. Yeah. And so, okay, so if I'm in an yeah. infinite dimensional RKHS, I cannot define such an object. Oh, sure. I understand. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah, so the technical detail there is a little tricky. Uh, you can think of it as, so there are two, this is a kind of area where, you know, perhaps things have been glossed over a little. So I think there are two ways of tackling that problem. One is to use the double sample trick. So you would actually have uh, a way of bounding generalization on a test point in terms of its performance on a double sample or on a randomly chosen second sample. So then you can project into the, the uh, dimensions 2M, you know, twice the, uh, and it becomes uh, finite. I mean, the basic so idea is prior, that in a, So in which case the prior, so the, if I understand sorry. the prior, then in on the, uh, you're putting the prior then on the uh, database representation on the evaluation. So maybe I, I, I jumped too quickly. Maybe I should back off. The idea of the thing is it's working with a Gaussian process. But if you're not happy with a distribution, a Gaussian process distribution, this would be then a way of avoiding having to use that uh, uh, okay. mathematical model. So the idea is you take a double sample, then if you project uh, so then now, if you think of your function, you only have to analyze the performance on the second half of that sample. So now you limit your functions to their performance on that double sample. Now everything's finite dimensional. So even if you started with an infinite dimensional RKHS, you effectively project into the dimension spanned by the uh, double sample and it becomes a finite dimensional. And so you can then apply, you know, treat it as a Gaussian literally. So as I say, there is, you picked up a slight, uh, if you like, uh, things are slightly being swept under the carpet here, but I, I think it's, uh, it, they certainly, you know, can be made rigorous in that sense. Hopefully that, okay, thank you. does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, so here, the idea is to define the prior in terms of the true risk function, which we don't know, of course, um, but as a, a Boltzmann distribution, uh, and then the posterior is in, defined in terms of its uh, empirical counterpart, so the empirical risk. Um, now you might say, well, you know, this this kind of feels very weird for a, particularly for a Bayesian because you know you actually need to define the prior, you need to know what it is, you need to be able to compute with it. Here we're defining it in terms of things we don't uh, actually know them. However, it's valid because it doesn't depend on the sample. That was the condition. It mustn't depend on the sample. Uh, so in principle, the, the, the result is valid. The question is, can you evaluate the result? But if you remember that the uh, only place in which the prior appears is in that KL between the prior and posterior distributions. So if we can estimate the, the KL divergence between these two distributions, then we can apply the bound. It may not be you know, fully tight in that sense that the, you know, this estimation may be weak, but uh, nonetheless we can. And that's exactly what uh, has been done uh, originally by Olivier Catoni, and then we looked at it uh, in maybe framed it in a more uh, statistical learning framework, but the, uh, basic result is that there's a, you know, a very somewhat unusual further dependence uh, on N uh, that is, uh, you know, normally these bounds would be uh, one on N. This is one on N to the three over two uh, in terms of the complexity terms, which depend on this quantity gamma, which is controlling the, uh, the distributions here. Uh, however, this is quite, I mean, it's a very nice, uh, uh, I think, idea, uh, but it's a little bit difficult to work with that posterior distribution, that Boltzmann distribution. Uh, but I think it's still an interesting thing for further explanation. Um, uh, so uh, the Gibbs, yeah, so I think I've just said that already. Uh, so here's some alternative examples that you might try. So you could take the uh, weight vector for the prior to be this expectation of y times phi of x. Again, that uh, can be done, but doesn't work very well. Um, uh, but what we've also looked at is taking the prior to be the expected weight vector under the true distribution of 
randomly generated training sets. So if you imagine keep using, you know, generating training sets of size M and you keep uh, generating uh, SVMs and looked at the weight vectors and then look at that distribution and take the mean of that distribution, uh, then we were able to bound the uh, KL divergence between a uh, that point and uh, the posterior distribution that we observe. Uh, the, so I won't go into the detail, it's connected stability and I'm a little short of time so I'm going to skip over this section. Um, and uh, uh, just to say that it results in a much tighter bound but with a fundamental weakness so this is the prior, the expected weight vector, and this is the posterior, the particular weight vector that we observe. Uh, and we're able to obtain these, uh, these, these bounds, as I said. Um, so it, it, it is, uh, you know, kind of very uh, satisfying in one way, but dissatisfying in another that was pointed out by uh, Caroline, Carolina and Dan Roy in that they, uh, observe that this actually doesn't depend on the function. I'll mention that again later. So that uh, although this band looks very interesting and intriguing, it actually isn't taking into account the particular weight vector. It's bounding these uh, different uh, sort of independently of the actual uh, solution that you get. Uh, so I'm going to now move to performance of deep neural networks. So deep learning has thrown down a challenge to statistical uh, learning theory in that it has very good performance with extremely complex hypothesis classes. And, you know, in the frame of mind of most statistical uh, learners, that's, uh, you know, a sort of red flag of, uh, you know, complex class, we're going to overfit. Uh, so for SVNs, the way that's overcome is through this margin that captures something about the accuracy with which we need to learn, estimate the weights. Um, and perhaps the deep learning uh, could be analyzed in a similar way. Uh, if we could find uh, a wide basin, that would suggest that the, uh, you know, a local minimum perhaps, or even a global minimum, but with a wide basin of attraction, that would suggest that the, you know, the weights are quite flexible and we could have a very broad posterior around the solution. So uh, as I say, Carolina and, and Dan have, have looked at this and derived some of the tightest bounds in, in this way uh, by trying to expand the basis of attraction uh, and uh, uh, but not measuring, you know, typically doesn't give good generalization if you would use the normal training SGD algorithm. So it, it's clearly not uh, fully capturing, and this was the point I made earlier about the observation for the lever et al band, uh, actually not capturing the key properties of the actual function that's learned. Um, so there've also been suggestions that stability of SDD is important in attaining good generalization, which links back to the work I skipped over a moment ago. So uh, I'm now going to uh, re relay some experiments which uh, to some extent uh, build on the work of uh, Carolina and Dan Roy, Dugati and uh, Dan and Roy. Uh, so, but we're uh, again using part of the training uh, data as we did before in the previous uh, SVM experiments to determine a prior um, and then use the second part to perform an optimization of a pack based bound. Um, and we've looked at uh, three variants. The classic is, I think, the one that, uh, that uh, Dan may be correct me, but I think this was the one that was used by uh, uh, Carolina and Dan. We've looked at this uh, Pinsk inequality, which is a, a more, ref sorry, refined Pinsk inequality, which is uh, we're calling F quad. And then the F lambda based on the lambda bound that I presented at the beginning. And then there's a bound based on variational inference. Um, so the, this is just some, you know, we did a lot of experiments with these different uh, optimizations. And this is just giving uh, some indication of the test error versus the risk certificate. So this is somehow 
giving an indication of how accurate the model selection is based on these bounds. And uh, I think you know this is quite encouraging. Um, uh, but these are ones that are trained with this type of approach. So uh, of course there is somehow a bias perhaps in the selection here. Um, so uh, I'm now going to present some, you know, results and talk a little bit about the kind of performance that we're getting. So firstly, this is the performance of, well, actually, I might skip this and go straight. This was for MNIST, uh, the digits data set. Um, and the second set are for CIFAR, which is a more complex data set. So maybe I'll just skip to those. Uh, so this is the performance. Um, for different uh, complexity of networks. So the CNN and convolutional neural net with nine layers or 15 layers. So we're talking pretty complex networks. We, this is the performance of the prior. Um, and then this is the performance of these three columns uh, give the performance of the learned predictor using the these different uh, optimization criteria, the F quad, F lambda, F classic, and F uh, B, BBB, which is the uh, uh, variational inference method. This varies the amount of data used. And this is if you were to continue training just using stochastic gradient descent uh, and arrive at a deterministic predictor. So this is taking the mean of the distribution as your deterministic predictor. This is doing what you're supposed to in terms of stochastic prediction, and this is doing ensemble prediction, taking a sample from the posterior distribution and just taking the average classification of that. So the bound, and these are the risk certificates. Now we've done one for cross entropy, which is, uh, I, you know, I won't talk much about, it, but there's the zero one error one, which is perhaps the one that uh, we're, we're probably gonna look at more. Um, so I think the first thing to note is that uh, there are, you know, the risk certificates and the stochastic error performance are very close. So for example, here, uh, 2.5, uh, 0.25 to 0.21. Uh, and even in the deep networks, uh, so here, um, 0.18 to 0.1463. Um, the training does improve on uh, the slightly, only slightly, which is somewhat disappointing on the, uh, this is the performance of the prior predictor before we do the second stage of the training. Uh, so there is some improvement, but not a lot. Uh, but nonetheless, the bands are actually giving us a very close performance indicator of the actual performance of the uh, uh, of the learnt networks, both in terms of, well, this is to say what they apply to, but actually the performance of these two are also, you know, very much uh, similar. Um, so you can look at these, there's a very little difference between the stochastic, deterministic and ensemble predictors. Um, so uh, maybe just to mention that this is a very flexible framework and can be applied in many different uh, applications. I won't go into them because I've run out of time. Uh, so I just finish with a conclusion slide just saying, you know, key question is learning in learning is generalization. And modern machine learning appears to contradict many of the conclusions of statistical learning theory, but modeling learning in a more refined way leads to bounds that overcome this contradiction and throw light on different ingredients in achieving good test performance. And they can drive algorithms that give improved bounds and state-of-the-art performance. Um, but I want to emphasize many other aspects of deep learning still remain to be captured by theoretical analysis, for example, domain shift, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I won't go in you know, learning representations and so on. So there's still m much more to do, but I just want to hopefully convince you that the, uh, there is you know, significant progress in this area. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, uh, let's thank Tom for the interesting talk. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, maybe I'll start with one high-level question. 
Oh, actually, do, we do have a question um, from Dev David Dubashi. Um, so the question is, um, do these approaches shed any light on the double dip phenomenon of parents? A very, very good question. I, it's something we've been exploring. Uh, so what we found is that yes and no. Yes, we are able to show a double dip um, in uh, using bounds of this type. Um, however, uh, uh, if we apply this naively, we don't show, uh, I mean, the we show a sort of double dip like this, but the levels are not captured. In other words, frequently where the, in the double dip generalization is really a lot better as you go into the second part of the dip, uh, actually uh, our bounds show very little, if any, uh, improvement in that stage. Uh, and what we believe is that we need to take into account uh, this idea of an expectation prior. Um, so that, I mean, that's our current hypothesis here, but we are as yet not, uh, you know, this is ongoing work, uh, but uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting question to see whether they can, let's say to some extent they can, but I don't believe they capture the phenomenon in full. Okay, um, so the next question is from Kevin. Um, the question is, are the deep learning experiments equivalent to choosing the strength of the L2 regularizer based on P percent of the data, and then fitting the model on the rest of the data using that estimated hyperparameter, or is the second stage the most important? So the, um... The idea is that uh, you learn the prior based on part of the data. I think that's clear. And that sets you, if you like, a, a, a target. Um, so yes, it is an L2 regularizer effectively being used. You're correct. Uh, but it's factored in uh, using the different ways in which the bound actually combines with the empirical loss using these different uh, approximations, if you like, of the KL function. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, I, I can follow up. No, it's still not entirely clear, like sort of algorithmically, um, what you do. Like, I, I'm not sure how you choose the strength of the regularizer in stage one, and I'm not sure my understanding is then once you fix that prior, then you optimize this bound on the loss function in stage two. So it's a different objective than people standardly use in, you know, yes, penal correct. I'm, most, I, I'm, correct. I'm familiar with like, you know, penalized maximum likelihood, right? It's the, the standard thing that's very simple. So I understand that stage two is a different loss, but stage one, it wasn't clear what you're doing in stage one. Oh, sorry, so, sorry. Stage one is just standard stochastic gradient descent. Oh. I see. And then where do you get the magnitude of, oh, using like a, like a zero one Gaussian prior, and then you just, the resulting uh, standard deviation of that, how, how do you get the magnitude of the uncertainty after stage one training? Uh, you in, you uh, generate, you uh, create a distribution uh, around the a Gaussian distribution around the weight vector learned by the first phase. But with what confidence? I mean, that's the scaling uh, factor. What, okay, you have to set that through a, a cross-validation estimation, or through the through the bounds. Oh, I see. So you you take part of your data, you do standard SGD training, and then let's say you do cross-validation to pick the confidence of that, and then you freeze that distribution, and then you optimize your your KL bound in stage two. Exactly. And if yeah. you didn't do the stage two, if you did standard penalized training in stage two, it'd be very similar to the classical setup, basically, of regularized risk minimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we just continue doing scattic gradient descent, we end up with these uh, 
performances here. So yeah. we, we pay a price in terms of accuracy, but we get a certification in exchange for doing that. I see. Cool. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, are these bounds on the Gibbs excess error rather than that of a deterministic classifier? So the, the bound is on the Gibbs. So this is the bounds uh, in the certification is on the Gibbs. This is the Gibbs classifier, effectively, the stochastic classifier. Um, then the bound does not apply to these, but nonetheless, we put them in to show the equivalent performance. Thank you. Um, now, um, let's see. So um, the next question from, is from Yang. Um, the question is, I didn't quite follow the details of how the bounds are being apply to the networks. Um, again, networks and relation wide basins. Um, and also, what definition do you take for the width of a basin? Uh, so, uh, in this case, the, uh, the basin of attraction is effectively being optimized because it will reduce the stochastic error, if you see what I mean. So the, uh, the actual you know, posterior distribution is, is of fixed size, but by having uh, a big basin, the stochastic error will be reduced. Hence, the algorithm drives towards a large basin, and we get that uh, Results. So, the, 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 as, as Kevin was pointing out, you're essentially trying to not go far from your prior, um, and so that your KL is term is small, but find a region that has a, a basin that's quite large, and that will give you this low, uh, low training error. So, I'm, I'm certainly not claiming this is capturing, as I said, all of the features that uh, are indicative of good performance in deep learning. Um, it's more, uh, you know, I'm just trying to suggest that it is some hope <laughs> that we might get there. Uh, and it's certainly showing a direction in which there is an ability to bound the performance. Right. So we have a follow up question um, from Yam again. Um, so could you clarify on? It all went quiet. I'm not sure. Am I... Okay. So I think uh, we lost K. So maybe the uh, yeah. person can just ask a question. For everybody, or. Oh, yeah, I think he's come back. Oh, okay. All right. Then maybe it's my issue. Sorry. Um, no, no. Let's see. Um, was that question answered or? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm afraid I didn't get it. Sorry. I, I don't see the chat. I should have uh, figured out where the chat was. Sorry, I don't see it. I was waiting for you to read it to me. Okay, um, so I no longer actually see the previous questions uh, because my Zoom actually restarted. Um, so if oh, okay. there were any questions, if you, you can just unmute um, or maybe just retype the questions in the chat box, that would be great. Uh, oh, okay, so maybe that was the next question. Let me see. Um, Okay, so um, the question, I guess, from, is from Chen Yi Yang. Um, the question is, does the selection of prior distribution have any impact on the generalization uh, rates, um, uh, i.e. the second term in the pack basing theorem? 
Yes, of course. I mean, the, the, yes, absolutely. The, you know, the question, I mean, that's exactly what will happen. And that's why choosing that prior is such a, a tricky or, or critical part of the equation. Um, the point I was making with the you know, comparison with Bayesian was that uh, the bounds hold whatever you know, choice you make, provided you make it before you see the data. Um, of course, if you make a good choice, you'll get a better bound. Um, but, um, you know, obviously without cheating, <laughs> then, then you'll get better off. Maybe it's worth commenting that, I mean, the, the bound looks like it is gives you a parametric square root one over n rate, but <laughs> one second, one second. Um, but the actual rate look is probably more like a non-parametric rate, which surely is improved by good choice of priors. But I don't think anyone has that good of a, of a handle on that in the deep learning regime. Uh, I agree. Thanks, Ben. Okay, um, looks like all the questions have been answered. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to chime in now. Um, so you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Purple. Okay, I guess there aren't any more questions. So um, yeah, so I guess that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank John again.